G'day there guys, it's your Aussie hubby Marky, back at it again with another episode of r slash legal advice. Now if you love me like I love you, then you know what to do. I want you to sit back, relax, chuck that prawn on the barbie, and get ready for some bloody good legal advice. Yes, I said that prawn. That one right there. Posted by user Mike's Big. Titled, My dentist was just arrested for posing as a dentist. Medicine and malpractice. Yep, my dentist was a fraud. I have had extensive dental work done here, including implants, an extraction, and several crowns. The news article I read said that she had damaged a lot of people's teeth. I did have issues with my implant. It actually came completely out after lots of pain and me trying to convince them it was loose. So what should I do? I'm thinking I should go to another dentist to have everything looked over, at least. This was not a hole-in-the-wall, shady operation. This is a very large, nice dentist office. There were no red flags, and everything seemed completely normal other than the issues I had with the work. What actions should I take, if any? Thanks in advance. I am in Georgia, USA. You're a crime victim. Contact the police and let them know that you're a victim. If this person had a nice large office, like you say, he or she is likely facing a very long list of criminal charges and is probably facing significant prison time. There will likely be a restitution component to his or her criminal case, and that might be your best bet of ever recovering any money from this person. Yes, OP, please be sure to bring screenshots of any appointment confirmation and any other documents you have. The Georgia Criminal Justice Coordinating Council maintains a victim's fund where you can apply to receive up to $25,000 in benefits. Also, inquire about starting a class action lawsuit if someone hasn't already. There are likely other people who this affected who are also out a lot of money and healthy teeth. OP, if I'm reading the vibe of your post correctly, you want to be sure your mouth is in healthy shape and concern for your money is secondary. I agree. Look for a well-established dental office and tell them your situation. You don't know if the fake dentist could have used some toxic materials in doing fillings, etc. Getting a well-experienced dentist to give the work a once-over would be prudent. Edit, this could affect health going forward and can impact someone for years, I learned from experience. Absolutely, I know nothing about lawsuits. I'm not trying to get rich, but if something isn't right, I certainly don't want to pay for dental work all over again. I'm glad I figured that right. At the very least, you should be able to get in with a great dentist. I would think most would step up for giving a check. Your dental insurance, if you have some, may also have a fraud unit. You should also let them know. I would recommend that you do some research before you choose a new dentist. While there are many ethical, trustworthy practitioners out there, some recommend interventions that are unnecessary. If you're willing to travel, I highly recommend faculty practices at dental schools. The professors have to have a certain number of hours with patients to maintain their licenses. As the school maintains the practice, dentists don't have the concerns about overhead, and they take the ethical code of the profession very seriously, so they're unlikely to recommend unnecessary intervention. There are no students present if you use the faculty practice, but if you're willing to be a guinea pig, you could contribute to future dentists' education and likely have fewer costs. At my dental school, it's likely that a faculty member would do the work, take a bunch of photos, and do grand rounds presentation on your case. Looks like UA Birmingham is slightly closer than GA's school in Augusta. Good luck, and sorry this happened to you. I second the recommendation of a dental school. I go to a practice in a hospital, where new dentists work alongside seasoned pros for a few years to gain experience before opening their own practices. It's clean, very inexpensive. I think I paid $90 for a checkup and cleaning with x-rays, and $90 more for a filling, and very professional. Whether you go to a school or work with new graduates, you'll be in good hands and under supervision from seasoned dentists. They should also be happy to help with documentation in your situation, too. It would actually be a good experience for them to have under their belts. Good luck, OP. I hope everything works out for the best. Go to a dentist and tell him or her to document any damages to your teeth, etc. Get the dentist to write a report. If the damages can be photographed, very good. Attach them, too. Don't forget a description of the picture, though. And attach it to the police report slash filing. I'd recommend you to also get a lawyer and sue this fraudulent dentist. 
Lumpy Space Queen says, If you have insurance and this was paid for by them, contact them. Some services have limitations, so if you try to have the service done at a different office, it might be denied and you would have to pay the full cost out of pocket. Also, please do not procrastinate. Contact the Georgia Professional Licensing Board immediately. Ask about the procedure to file a formal complaint against someone posing as a dentist without a license to practice. That is a significant issue that will bolster your case. Please talk with your local law enforcement as well. Charges should ultimately be filed. Update, I've now read quite a bit about her. She's done this in at least two counties in Georgia. I cannot imagine how the victims are feeling. There's a lot of good advice in this thread, but something others neglected to consider is a blood panel done at your primary physician, or if they can't fit you in immediately, go to your local ER. There are certain bloodborne illnesses that will have more options for treatment if you catch them now, versus after going to a second dentist, the prosecutor's office, etc. Tell the physician what happens, and they can do a workup as well as prescribe antiretroviral medications to keep you from suffering more than you need to due to this exposure. Was this dentist in network for your insurance, or were you completely out of pocket? If they were credentialed through your insurance company, you may also have a case against them. Yes, everything went through my insurance until the insurance maxed out, then I would pay out of pocket. So they are supposed to credential the doc slash dentist, meaning doing a thorough search of background and complaints and training, etc. Edit, read the rest of your post in Saw Georgia, contact the Department of Insurance and file a complaint. This just keeps getting worse as I read more comments, oh my god! How does this even happen? This would have to have had skipped so many layers of protection. I think what was happening here is that she had an actual dentist employed. She was the owner of the practice, but wasn't actually medically trained or licensed herself. She was performing work in the office along with the dentist, and sometimes by herself. How do you know she wasn't medically trained or licensed? Kind of an important detail. I'll add, just because you suck at your job doesn't mean you were not trained. This guy obviously doesn't realize or read the news, I guess. He didn't know that she was doing this everywhere. Alright, that's it for all the original comments. The rest just repeat the same advice. If I was the OP, I would be screaming for every test to be done, every lawyer to throw the book at this woman. That is disgusting. On to the update. Update, my dentist was arrested. I want to first thank everyone here for the awesome advice you gave. I have never been in a situation where I needed legal advice, so it was all very unfamiliar to me. I really do appreciate everyone taking the time to respond and help me. I have followed what I was told here, and I wanted to give everyone an update on my situation. First, let me give everyone a little clearer picture of what was happening. The person in question owned the practice that I was visiting. She employed an actual dentist, but she herself was not licensed as anything at all, and had no business touching patients. Most of my work was done by her and a dentist together. Obviously, I can't see what's going on in my mouth, so I'm not sure what she did and what he did. But according to the information I've gotten, she shouldn't have been touching me or anyone else. The person's husband was a local police officer, and I'm a firefighter. This officer gave discounts to public safety and offered no interest financing. So a lot of public safety used these offices. People were also wondering how this could happen and how anyone could be fooled. This is a large dentist office. Everything was nice, nothing looked or felt strange, and everyone was friendly. I wasn't in someone's basement or in the back of a tattoo parlor getting dental work done. This was a freestanding brick building with 10 dental chairs, full staff, and the waiting room was always full. The first thing I did was visit another actual dentist. Unfortunately, I was given bad news. Everything that was done at the previous office has to be repaired or replaced. I have two root canals that weren't done properly. Oh, that hurts to hear! Four crowns that I'm experiencing sensitivity in that aren't seated correctly, an additional crown that has to be replaced, and a filing that was done incorrectly, resulting in that tooth now needing a root canal and crown. My final treatment plan to correct all of this from the new dentist is right at $12,000. Next, I contacted the DA's office from both counties where this office operated. The DA explained that they were looking into cases where this person worked on patients without a dentist present. 
and seemed uninterested in my case because I couldn't tell them of a specific instance where it was just me and the office owner without a dentist present. They still took my information and the records I collected and said they may look into it further. I also contacted an attorney. The attorney did not seem optimistic at all about the outcome of this. He is currently reviewing everything I've given him and we were to meet again next week. I'm not sure whether or not he will be taking this case, but I will be sure to update everyone here when I find something out. The attorney stated that the practice may not have insurance. Lots of people will be going after her, and because a dentist was present, I may not have much of a case. I will likely get a second opinion if this attorney declines to take the case. My dental work was done over a period of several years as I could afford it, and $12,000 is nothing to sneeze at for me. If it can work in my favor, I certainly need it to. I also called my insurance company at the advice of the DA because of the insurance fraud aspect of this. There was a language barrier and they couldn't seem less interested. After a frustrating five minutes trying to explain things, I hung up. This happened in Georgia, USA. Once again, thank you for all your help. No matter the outcome, I am appreciative of everyone here for at least helping me make a run at things. Posted by user Throwaway Help Kid, titled Michigan, Teen Staying With Us For The Past Eight Months, How To Get Him Emancipated Or Get Custody Of Him. Last year, my son, Ian, 15, befriended a new kid at school, Kevin, 15. On New Year's Eve, Ian asked us if Kevin could spend the night because his parents were out of town and he didn't want to be alone. The next morning, Kevin left, but came back two hours later, asking Ian if he could stay one more night. It wasn't a problem for us. After the third night, Kevin stayed at our place. We asked to call his mother to check if she was okay with him staying. He said she didn't care and refused to answer when we pressed further. After a bit of debating, we took Ian aside and told him we didn't mind Kevin staying, but if he had run away from home, we should know and let his mother know he was safe. Ian then told us that Kevin's mother had thrown him out and didn't want him to come back. Ian wouldn't say why, so we asked Kevin to join us and told him unless he told us the whole story, he couldn't stay because we didn't want to be liable for anything. Well, in the fall, Kevin fell in love with another boy and he decided that New Year's Eve was a good time to tell his parents because he wanted to start the new year by being himself. His parents didn't take the news well and told him to get the hell off of my house. He then spent the night at our house thinking they were in shock and went back the next morning to talk to them. They didn't change their mind and forbade him from going back, saying he would take advantage of and corrupt his young brother and he was no longer their son and wouldn't be until he found his way back on the right path. He started crying when telling us the story, so we left him alone. I asked for his mother's number, which he gave me, and I called her saying that Kevin was at our place and could we talk to them to see if things could get better. She basically told me to freak off and to keep her sick deviant son or to just put him on the streets and forget about him. Of course, I wasn't about to do that. So I asked if we could come get some of his stuff, like clothes and school material. We went there, just my husband and me. And while we gathered Kevin's belongings, she kept insulting him and his homosexuality and telling us we would rot in hell for helping him. My husband told her to shut the hell up and we came home to the boys. Kevin has been with us since then. We kept sending his mother texts and pictures and updates in hopes she would change her mind and realize her son needs her. We were waiting for her to come back and take him back and be a fudging parent. So we just let time slip and didn't do anything. We treated Kevin as our son and grew to love him as such. Last week was his birthday. We threw a party with friends and family and invited his parents. During the day, Kevin got a text from his mother saying, 15 years ago, I gave birth to a son and today I wish I didn't. You live in sin. I can no longer call you my son as I can't have love for a twisted human. I wish you no harm, but I don't wish you happiness. And as long as you think it is normal for a man to love another man, you will no longer be a part of the family. Enjoy living with the sinners you belong to. As soon as Kevin showed us the text, my husband was in the car to go see her. She told him basically the same thing. Either we keep Kevin or we throw him out. She doesn't care. There is no doubt from the multiple times we tried to talk to her that she won't change her mind. 
We asked Kevin what he wanted to do, and we had a meeting with his therapist. We sent him to therapy around February because he started cutting himself, refused to eat or leave his room. Kevin wants to be free of his mother. So my question is, what are the steps? Can he be emancipated? Can we get legal custody of him? Can we adopt him? We always had hope his parents would change his mind, but after his birthday, we know they won't. We love Kevin as if he were our son, and we don't want him to suffer any more than he has already suffered. My husband and I are not educated when it comes to the law, and we are lost. Any advice will be more than welcome. Thank you. TLDR, our son's gay friend is living with us since January. His mother doesn't want him to be in her family anymore. What legal steps can we take so he can stay with us and be legally free of his parents until his majority? Not a lawyer, work in LE. First thing, you're good people. It's awesome of you to take in a stranger's child and treat them as your own. Second, you should contact CPS. What his parents did is very illegal. They won't remove him from your custody because you have provided a safe environment for him. Lastly, contact a family law attorney. See if you can get the parents to sign off on an adoption. You can ask the lawyer about having the parents pay child support as well if you feel so inclined. Glad to hear you've got him in therapy. I hope he is doing well, and I hope you're all in a good place mentally, emotionally, and financially, dealing with the mess his parents have made. Thank you for your answer. As I said in another comment, we were all afraid to call CPS because we feared that he would be placed with strangers. I know there are a lot of incredible foster families, but changing his life again was something I wanted to avoid. And when he is home, I know he is well and safe but I will be contacting them before contacting a family attorney. If there is a possibility things turn out as we want and his parents have to pay child support, I will push for it and put the money on an account for Kevin. Therapy helps a lot. He hasn't cut himself in two months now. He was doing great until his birthday party, so we hope that he will be able to overcome these events. He's a strong kid. Thank you. I'm not a lawyer, but maybe contact a lawyer before calling child services just to show, if anything, that you are serious about getting legal guardianship of the child. Also, a lawyer may be better to help you with what you exactly say to CPS. Thank you for your recommendation. My husband is already looking for an attorney so we can get things going. Good. I wish you the best of luck. You guys are awesome for helping this poor boy. I saw a few people talking about child support. My only concern is the family refusing to pay and deciding to take him back only to treat him terrible just to be spiteful. If affordable, I would try to cut as many ties as humanly possible. Just my opinion, though. Yes, we managed fine without their help so far, so I think we could get it that way. However, if they are obliged by law to give us child support, it would go in an account for Kevin, because he deserves at least something from them to help him down the road. Yeah, that would be a good idea for sure. Again, you guys are the best. To add to this, while they likely won't remove him from OP's custody, they will want to complete a home study to make sure it's an appropriate environment. Sometimes they let the child remain in the home until that gets completed, sometimes they don't. As long as everything is kosher, they will likely approve continued placement. Thank you for your input. We will contact CPS. Fortunately, I think our home is suitable. Kevin has his own room in what used to be my husband's office slash playroom. He has his own bed and school material, his clothes and access to bathroom, food and water as he wishes. I have had a guardianship of my minor sister. CPS can't place children with unlicensed non-family members, so they could actually remove the child from the home for foster care unless they obtain guardianship. Thank you for your input. Do you know how and if we could be licensed family if we can't obtain guardianship? I live in Michigan. I'm going through a similar situation. You can become a licensed foster parent for free in three to six months. There's a few classes, a home study, and fingerprinting. Guardianship would be a faster route in your case. In my county, the probate court has CPS investigate and perform a home study after you file for guardianship. The filing fee was $180, and I did it without a lawyer. The probate court attorneys helped me fill out the forms for free. CPS will contact his parents during the home study. If his parents are willing, then they can file for you to have limited guardianship. If they are unwilling to file and attend the hearing, you need to file for full guardianship. In Michigan, that's how it is. I am a lawyer. 
talk to a family lawyer before you do anything else. CPS tries to do the right things, but sometimes they don't, and it's better to talk to an attorney who knows CPS in your area and can guide you. Ask the lawyer about the possibility of termination of parental rights and adoption. In my state, if non-custodial parents don't want the kid, they can voluntarily give up parental rights, and then that leaves you free to adopt the kid. Again, talk to a lawyer. I know they're expensive, but an initial consultation shouldn't be. A lot of firms even do those for free. Thank you for your answer. My husband is searching for an attorney after reading the comments, and we hope to get an appointment as soon as possible. I would like to think his parents won't be much trouble if we want to take him in legally, but I don't exactly trust them to make the right choices for their son. In any case, we will hire an attorney and do what we can. I'm a lawyer too. Today, like now, get on the phone and make an appointment with a lawyer about getting a temporary or emergency guardianship that you can make permanent. Don't call CPS first. For about 15 years, my law practice consisted of a lot of juvenile court cases involving neglect and abuse, but not in your state where I am not licensed. In my experience, CPS does not always leave kids in safe environments, although removing a teenager is less likely than removing a younger child. Kevin's been through enough and doesn't need the added trauma of CPS investigating. Depending on your lawyer's advice, asking the court to order CPS to be involved to get services like counselling for Kevin might be a great idea. Once the judge in the guardianship case hears why the guardianship for Kevin is necessary, he or she may go ahead and have CPS investigate the home for abuse. You can also ask the parents to pay child support if you have guardianship. Thank you for your answer. My husband is currently in contact with our local LGBTQ centre, a shelter for young adults in Kevin's situation. As a commenter suggested, we try and ask if they have recommendations for an attorney. They also told us to have a lawyer before engaging with anything with CPS, as they had the experience of a young girl being replaced with her parents that run away a few weeks later. So far, we have two suggested attorneys and we'll make an appointment with both to make sure we cover all bases. And besides this, we have no further update from the OP. Edit. Thank you all, thank you so much for the advice you've given me, and for the outpouring of love for my husband, Ian, Kevin, and me. Thank you for the numerous private messages I received, and for the multiple offers I got to open up a GoFundMe for our legal fees. Fortunately, my parents and in-laws, who took Kevin in as easily as we did, already offered to help us pay for all of that. But thank you for the bottom of my heart for all your kindness and empathy. After some recommendations from commenters, we contacted our local LGBTQ center and shelter to do the right thing at the time. We will meet with them and their lawyer tomorrow, and they already gave us two recommendations for family law attorneys they worked with. We will then proceed as our attorneys see fit, and I will update you on Kevin's fate. Thank you all so much. You're a great community. Keep on loving. And as unfortunate as it is, I think we have to respect that there's not a further update, and that's good news regardless. Kevin is in a good situation, he's in much more supportive hands, and I love OP for that. I respect them for sharing the story, and I hope that Kevin has a good future ahead of him. Hope you guys enjoyed this one, I'm going to chuck you now to Outro Marky. Alright guys, that's all for today's episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, be sure to tell me what you thought about it down in the comments down below. If you're new to the channel also, don't forget to subscribe. It would really help out with my channel growth. And also, a huge shout out to my channel patrons and members. I just love you guys and thank you for supporting me on this journey. If you guys are new to the channel and you'd like to support me, links are down below for the Patreon, or you can click the join button next to subscribe if you'd like to become a channel member. Alright guys, that's all for today's episode. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you have a good day, night, sleep, whatever you're up to, and I'll see you in the next episode. Bye.